889. Good morning. Welcome to Dayton Church of Christ. Eight, eight, nine. Have you a heart that's weary? Good morning. We're going to be reading Psalms chapter 89, the first 37 verses this morning. Psalms 89, make sure, yeah, verse 37. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said steadfast love will be built up forever in the heavens and you will establish your faithfulness. You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who, is in the, who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? For among the heavenly beings is like the Lord, a, great, a God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones, and awesome above all who are around him. O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. You rule the raging of the sea. When, when its waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with, all, with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth is also yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon joyously praise your name. You have a mighty arm, strong, in your, strong as your hand, high your right hand. Righteous and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are the people who know the, fest, the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face who exult in, your name, uh, uh, exult in your name all the day, and in your righteousness are exalted. For you are the glory of, his, of their strength. By your favor our horn is exalted, for our shield belongs to the Lord, our King to the Holy One of Israel. Of old you spoke in a vision to your godly one and said, I have granted help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found David my servant 
with my holy oil I have anointed him, so that my hand shall be established with him. My arm shall also, my arm shall also strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, You are my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And I will make him the firstborn and the highest of the kings of earth. My steadfast love I will keep forever, for him forever, and my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his offspring forever and his throne as the days of the heavens. If his children forsake my laws and do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will, pun then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquities with stripes. But I will not remove from him my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth forth from my lips. Once for all I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever, his throne as long as the sun comes up before me. Like the moon, it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the skies. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you at this time and we thank you, Lord, for uh, the promises that we have promises that you gave us uh, from the beginning of time. Lord, we pray that as we know, Lord, that we come here as, as your people, we pray, Lord, that you watch over us, that you watch over the teachers as they, they help um, teach the word of God to us. We pray, Lord, that the words that we hear, that they may help strengthen us, that we may be stronger and uh, closer joined to you. As we go throughout this class, we pray, Lord, for you to be with us all. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We'll go to our classes now. Teachers can go first. We have the nursery class, this is zero to two year old, and the three to five year old class. First grade through the fifth grade. The middle school and high school class. Have the young adult class. <laughs> Ladies class that meets in fellowship room. Good. Then we have the adult class here in our tour. Anybody that still doesn't have a copy of our folder? <clears throat> We're going to continue this morning thinking about uh, Bible study and how to set up a study and how to conduct one. And uh, if uh, you are filling yours out, but you want a, a blank copy to use uh, with someone, I've got these extra ones. Since we have just one more week uh, in this class, then uh, I suspect we'll still have some of these left over. And if you don't get one and you want one like that, let me know. I have the uh, originals at, at home. 
uh, that we can uh, make copies for. Any particular questions or thoughts from last week or anything left over that uh, we've kind of tried to go back over some of the basic things each week so that we would make sure we kept them <laughs> in, our, in our thoughts and our minds. Hopefully you've uh, taken some notes and written some of those things down. But anything about you know, setting up a study initially, uh, that type of thing. Okay, one particular reminder again is that the, the importance of, you know, answering a question with a question uh, is, is one of the more important things, I think, to do once you get into a particular study. Uh, if a particular issue is brought up uh, and they emphasize a, a particular line of thinking that may or may not fit what the Bible actually says, it's good uh, to simply say, you know, wh why do you think that? Or, or why is that what you, you believe? And that type of thing. And my experience has been that that, number one, will get a lot more talk from them. But it also shows many times that they're, they're not really sure why uh, they believe a particular doctrine. Or why they think a particular way about you know, baptism or the church, music, you know, any of those issues that are a little bit difficult sometimes to deal with. And what a question does is get them to thinking along that line. Uh, if you'll notice in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, I think there's, you know, eight at least questions that Jesus used uh, to, to answer. And many times when he didn't ask that question, the answer was so obvious, again, that it turned the thinking of the audience to uh, evaluate why they think, uh, think a certain thing or why they uh, believe. And as I noted, uh, my experience has been that they are not really sure. Now, one of the dangers with that and with the study itself is that they can give the right answers many times, but not really have a clue to the significance of that particular answer. So that's where in you have to try to the best of your ability to put thoughts in their mind, you know, based upon what the Bible really teaches for them to, to dwell on or to, to think on. And I told you that some of the studies that I have done uh, over the years, uh, although the folks were giving the right answers, they, they did not really have a real good clue as to, to what that actually meant in reference to their lives, in reference to the importance of, of changing uh, a particular thing uh, or um, following a particular idea. Anybody with anything there? Yes. Yeah, it's a good point because I, I've made that mistake, you know, and get a long ways along and then come to realize by, by something that they said that they had not gotten the point. And I think, too, that, that it springs off of that also into the, uh, to, to the pronouns. Um, and, and this is sort of one of my pet peeves anyway is, 
you know, when, even when we're praying. Um, and, you know, for example, talking about somebody that, that needs to respond, you know, to the invitation. And expression that we use lots of times, you know, uh, if, if there's anybody here that needs, uh, I prefer to say, if any of us need to respond. Uh, and, and, and those pronouns, and I think that becomes very important in a Bible study. Uh, to, are you willing to change? Am I willing to change? Uh, and as we study, then what that does is that takes uh, an emphasis uh, on the fact that, you know, I'm not saying I have all the answers, and I'm so, not saying I'm right all the time. I want to continue to study. I want to continue to learn. Uh, and, and so are, are we willing to change if we see that we need to, to make a change? Exactly. And uh, maybe there's different ways of doing that or approaching it. But uh, you're exactly right. Uh, and that's why you mentioned you have to start with God in the Bible. And, and that's what this particular first lesson does. It starts with establishing uh, belief in God and that the Bible is his word. And if we're willing to accept that and make changes if we find out that we've not been doing what we should do or if we've never done, you know, what we should do. So, yes, anybody else with a thought there? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're exactly right, uh, Colby. And yes, and, and, and that, that's, that, that's right. And that's what Tom, I guess, is touching on too is the fact that you can talk a person in sometimes to doing something. If, and, and obviously, in a way, that's what you're, you're trying to do with preaching and teaching is to emphasize you know the need for change but just to talk them into it without them realizing the significance of it and the meaning of it uh, and I know that uh, that has been very true uh, over the years with with church attendance for example and uh, if a, a person is not accustomed to going to church uh, worship and Bible study then you know, there, there comes a point when you have to, to convince them that that is pleasing to God and it is something that they need to learn to want to do uh, and uh, so that they, they will be here and continue to develop uh, and grow. Um, not always an easy thing, but, but Colby, you're exactly right. Um, it, uh, until it becomes mine, until I believe that this is God's will for me, then I may just be going through the motions um, and not really pleasing God at all, although I may be doing the right things. Anybody else? Yeah, and, and nobody likes to be wrong. <laughs> nobody likes to be proven wrong. And as the teacher, if you have that attitude, then it's probably going to, to shine through. And I think that, you know, one of the things that, that we have to be aware of is that we try to keep it from becoming a competition because it's really not a competition. And to... To give them a chance, you know, to say what they think and, and what they uh, believe. And that might be, uh, you know, 
difficult sometimes because you just want to jump in there and say, now wait a minute, that's wrong. Uh, and it may very well be wrong, but especially to begin with, when you're first talking to a person, uh, if you start pointing out, well, you don't do this, you don't do this, and you don't do this, and your church doesn't, da, 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 you're probably not going to get very far. Uh, you're, you're probably going to stop right there as far as being able to have a, a good Bible study. So again, you know, I, I'd like to know what you believe. I'd like to know what, what you think. I, I'd like to know what your church uh, teaches if they actually go to church. And that allows you to build up confidence in you to where they're not thinking. Well, you know, he, he's just trying to prove me wrong or he's trying to get me to change or whatever. Now, that may be underneath at least a part of what you are trying to do, but if you come across that way, it just does, doesn't fly. <laughs> uh, you're probably not going to be able to really um, sit down. And also, I think in most cases, when you are talking to somebody about a Bible study, you have to stay away from basically, I'm right, you're right, I'm wrong, you're wrong, what you want to do is wait until you've got a Bible open. Because if you don't, uh, even if you can quote it, even if you can quote that verse, it's quite different than sitting down at, at, at the table, sitting down at the living room and opening your Bible and saying, you know, here is what you can do and you can read it for yourself. Um, we talked about the fact that there's a lot of, of ignorance about really what the Bible says. And, and, you know, we talk about it. We talk about, you know, reading our Bibles and, you know, hopefully even and on a daily basis, on a regular basis. And uh, we don't always get that done uh, with our busy lives. And when you're talking about somebody out there in the world, you know, uh, it's pretty rare that you find somebody that spends much time in actually reading their Bible. In fact, most folks will be just the opposite of that. So, again, bringing it back, what is God's will for me? What is God's will for you? So, good point. Anything else? Okay, on the, the first lesson on page one, I know we talked a little bit about these, but you notice that it does start uh, with, with God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, most of the time, these words, as we noted, will be the, the wording of what your Bible says. Uh, if a person is using uh, more of a, of a paraphrase, using a, a translation of the Bible that maybe really isn't even a translation anyway, you may have another word there. And, and that's not really an issue as a rule. When you get into some topics, particularly in the New Testament, some of these Bibles that are out there uh, have changed the thought, uh, and the wording isn't correct. You're probably not going to run into that too much. But one way to solve that uh, is to uh, you know, have copies of the Bible that are the same and encouraging them to use exactly what you are using. And I noted that sometimes people want to use their own Bible, and I found that as a rule that's not a problem. And if they're not real familiar with the books of the Bible, they'll come around and they'll be happy to use page numbers with you. But in any form that you might use, this a particular Bible study or the open Bible study, uh, the wording is not always going to match up. And so you just have to be aware of that. It's not really an issue as a rule. But this particular Two or three verses or two or three questions here all are establishing the fact that uh, there is a, a God. You have to try to make sure that they do understand that and that this is the God of the Bible. Uh, and you probably have more difficulty in showing that the Bible is God's word than you will 
with the fact that there is a God. But if you are dealing with someone that thinks of themselves as an atheist, then uh, you, obviously you're going to have to start at a different spot. So you may uh, need to uh, you know, find tracks, find literature, or develop a set of questions that would be able to establish that fact. And until you do that, and uh, as Tom was saying, there's certain things you have to start with, and if you don't start with those things, then uh, it's going to jump up and bite you at some point. And uh, in fact, there, I think it's maybe not on this first lesson, but um, there, there's a point somewhere where it talks about uh, some of the sheets that are, that are at the very back, and there's some sheets back here that ask some particular questions about, um, you know, there's, a, there's three or four worksheets, and basically what these are, this is over on page 17, 18, uh, and what you'll notice here is this is a review to see whether or not they're really getting the point. Uh, the Open Bible Study uh, that I've used many times also has a review sheet. So what it does is uh, it allows you to kind of find out whether or not they're actually getting the point or not and uh, to find out whether you need to back up maybe on a particular topic or thought and go back and, and review that. And uh, uh, this worksheet here on page 18 deals with the Old Testament, New Testament, which obviously uh, at some point you have to make sure you establish the fact that we're under the New Covenant, particularly when you get to talking about instrumental music and you get to talking about worship as a whole. They worship quite different, differently than we worship today uh, with their animal sacrifices, uh, even with um, instruments of music. Uh, David used them in worship and honor to God. God did, did not seem to be displeased with that at all. But when you get to the New Testament, then uh, every, use, every time that you find the word sing, the idea of music, uh, eight or nine times, in every case, it has to do uh, with, with vocal, uh, singing uh, from the heart, and, and the heart is basically the instrument that we use today. But if you've not established some of these principles, then somebody's going to go back under the old law and say, well, they uh, burned incense. They did this or they did that. And you have to make sure that we're understanding sort of this rightly dividing idea. So uh, question number two, back to page one, uh, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, true or false, God made man in his own image. And that that is true. And what does that mean? How would, you, how would you answer that? God made man in his own image. He established that's true. But what does that mean? Okay. Let's say what you'd think. Okay, okay. Somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that's the idea, Colby. And well, your response is a good response because... Yeah, yeah. Hey, see, that's the point. You're, who you're studying with may not be thinking the same way you are. And, and may have, as you said, they may have never thought about that. So how are we in the image of God? You know, as Pat is saying, we're talking here about not, not physical and material. We're talking, you know, spiritual. And, and all of us have within our bodies a spirit or, 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 or a soul. So what does it mean to be made in the image of God? It has to do with the spirit. It has to do with the fact that we can choose, we can make decisions, uh, and uh, we as a spirit being, we're, we're going to live forever. Uh, obviously, we want to make sure 
that we're trying to be more and more like God so that we can someday, you know, have a, have a home uh, in heaven. So also the fact that God made man, now you're getting into this idea of, of creation, and uh, man can't create anything. Man may reshape something. Uh, man may take something that God made, uh, and out of that, uh, reshape something. But life only comes uh, from God. Uh, and we have to, to establish that, that fact. If a person is really into, uh, you know, scientific explanation, for example, uh, scientifically, uh, this, this world, there's only two answers. <laughs> Either it was made by somebody or it just happened. Uh, and you get back into evolution and all of those different things. But scientifically, nothing comes from nothing. Uh, and that has been true and will always be true. And, and, you know, when you establish the fact that there's organization in nature or use your own body as to how, you know, I can stand here before you and somehow you, your brain processes and words come out and you're, you're sitting there thinking about what we're doing uh, that, that didn't happen by accident yes John good, good point good point in reference to, to knowing who you're talking to yeah and we talked about that a little bit but if, um, you know, let, let's say that uh, a couple of the Mormon elders, a couple of those young men that are not old enough to be elders, but if, if they're willing to, to sit down with you, knowing a little bit about what the, the Mormon church teaches, and it's not that hard to, to get, um, I guess you could use the Internet now and find out all sorts of things, but it's not that hard to know if you are dealing uh, with a Jehovah Witness person to know uh, how they feel about this idea of God or about the Spirit really allows you then to be much better prepared. But as we noted in the, one of the very first things that I said when we started these lessons, don't be ashamed to say, I don't know. And then you can back up and you can study it, and the next time you get together, you can be prepared. So, yes. Uh, and somebody may come up with something that's, you know, completely off the wall that you never even thought of. And uh, it's, it's not a bad thing. Uh, it's, it's something that will help you and will help me to grow. Uh, if we can learn, you know, here's another angle. And how do I answer that? What does the Bible say about that? So, uh, all of that you know, comes into the picture. I think also something I like to do is establish the fact when you're talking about God is a spirit uh, and man has a spirit or a soul. Man has the ability to decide and choose. Uh, that, that's what makes us different than the rest of God's creation. Uh, animals don't have that, the ability to discern the ability to, to choose, the ability to, to, to worship. And all of that comes in with the idea that as a Bible student, you must answer this for yourself. You must decide uh, how you'll feel and what you'll do. And it kind of brings it back to Colby's point. You know, you don't want just to talk somebody into it, but you want them to understand that this is what God's will for them is. Anybody else? Okay, number three, Genesis 2, 16 and 17. Did God give mankind instructions to live by in the beginning? Yeah, sure did, didn't he? Man has always had a law. In the Garden of Eden, you know, Adam and Eve were to keep the garden, uh, to, to dress the garden, uh, 
we don't know exactly all that maybe that entailed. It was one of those you know, perfect places. Um, uh, it sounded like they didn't have weeds, <laughs> you know, till later. Uh, so, uh, you know, maybe they didn't have thorns either. I, I don't know. But uh, anyway, you know, they had a law. Uh, and uh, the individuals were instructed by God, such as Abraham, to instruct and teach his family, so forth and so on. Uh, and then you have the law of Moses. And now you have the New Testament. I think a lot of folks probably wouldn't be aware of this fact that you might talk to. Uh, the Bible's the Bible. You believe the Bible? Yes. Is all the Bible for us? Yes. But I think that we understand that you have to distinguish between the Old Testament and the New Testament and understand as far as the principles are concerned, truth and, and right and obedience starts in Genesis 1 and it goes all the way through. But when it comes to what to do to be saved and how to worship, then we are under uh, the new covenant. So God has always had a law. Number four, Genesis 3, 1 through 7, did man choose to disobey God? Yes. Why, why is, is that important when you're, when you're talking about, to, to somebody about what they're doing? Yeah. Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah. You're exactly right. In and you can also see why the the introduction of Satan here at this particular point, although it's kind of hard for any of us, I think you know he's talking through a snake here, and you you might. Uh, Chase a rabbit there that you don't want to necessarily chase. But I think you're establishing the fact that they had a choice. Uh, and they chose to disobey God. I have a choice. And you have a choice. And we need to look to see that we're making the right choice. Uh, it's a lot easier to maybe understand that I am wrong or I am doing something that God is not pleased with if I first am able to, to see that, that other folks have done that. That makes sense? You know, I, I'm not the only sinner in the world. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So in trying to establish, particularly in worship, uh, we'll get to uh, Nadab and Abihu as an example of strange fire if a person can understand that mistakes have been made from the very beginning of time when man chose to disobey God then it isn't a, a shock or it isn't surprising that we at times are wrong or that you are particularly wrong so uh, I guess to establish the fact that, that I'm not the only one that misunderstands. I'm not the only one that messes up. And again, I think that's building confidence in the person that you're talking to. Genesis 6, 5, and 6, did mankind become wicked early in its history? Now, sure they did, didn't it? So, you know, um, faithfulness, uh, believing in God, Trusting in God, uh, that, that begins again to establish that. In 1 John 3, uh, 4 through 8, sin is lawlessness. I think one translation says uh, the idea is missing the mark. And those two con who continue in sin are of the devil. Yeah, so what you're getting at here is there's going to be a need to, be, to make a change. Uh, and all of us at times have to change. And so this idea, again, that I mentioned, they can miss that point. You know, uh, you, you think what you want to think, I'll think what I want to think, sort of what Pat was getting at 
is, you know, what God reveals to me may be different than what God reveals to you. And so if you can't bring that back and establish the fact that it is the Bible, it, it is the Bible that tells us and it tells all of us what we need to do, then you're going to run into difficulties with some uh, particular uh, issues there. In Romans 6.23, and actually there's three passages here, does God let our sins separate us from him? Sure does. You know, God, God's holy. God, God is righteous. Now you're establishing the fact that uh, God loves us, God cares about us, but God expects obedience. And yes, I have the power to choose, and God gave me that power, but I must recognize that I can choose to do wrong, and obviously I'm going to pay the, the consequences of that. The next one in Romans 3.23, uh, very few people sin, and that is false. Um, Jesus died uh, for all, for all sin, all fall short. And uh, I had a little illustration that I use sometimes about this idea, uh, you know, Mistakes made by a child while, while trying to do right is one thing compared to a child that is throwing a fit uh, and is purposely doing something they know is wrong. That's pretty much where you and I are at. We're going to make mistakes even as we try, but we should not be deliberately, purposely, negligently doing those things that we know we shouldn't be doing. Uh, and so it is that, that habit of sin that is the issue. Nobody's going to be perfect. Uh, we all fall short. And I think establishing that and, again, emphasizing the fact that you are in the same boat with that person you're studying with from this standpoint. I've got to study. I've got to learn. I've got to change uh, at times, as does everybody else. And um, so the habit of sin, uh, in 1 John chapter 1, he talks a little bit about that, and there's some other passages that will emphasize, I think, that idea that it is, it is not that God expects us to be perfect, but he expects us to continue to try to do better, uh, and to make changes when we find ourselves in the wrong. Anybody with thought there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I think. Uh, no, well, you're exactly right. Jim is exactly right too. I would be a little mindful. I don't think I would say God lets us sin. God gives us a reason to choose. Actually, it says, "Does God let our sins separate us from Him?" And He does. So it's not that God. I mean, yeah, I guess it's accurate. God does let me choose. Uh, but I, I think that, we, again, the wording there might be a little confusing. So God allows me to do right or wrong. He allows me to choose. And uh, uh, so whoever you're talking to can choose. Uh, you know, sin definitely wasn't God's idea. Uh, obviously, you know, he gives us a choice. Yeah, okay. Uh, we'll, we'll take up right there, and we'll do a little bit more in that. And maybe look at the, uh, the charts a little bit next week as we tie all of these things together. Our next study, uh, two weeks away.